I'm going to talk about uh, ISIS and Jihad, but before I do, uh, I want to just share with you how I came to Islam because it's intertwined and why I had such interest in matters of war. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I was a student at Annapolis, we had this assignment where we were, we were assigned to uh, summarize the, the biographies of all the eminent scientists and philosophers of the Western civilization, so it's quite a task. So the library for this the book. And then came across this passage and it, it really grabbed my attention. It, it basically said that, that the majority of these materialists and scientists and philosophers in Western civilizations were believers in the transcendental, which is a, a, an academic neutral term for God, that the world was a created universe. So that was an extraordinary statement that the most revered and widely studied and respected minds in the Western civilization were believers in God, that their life and work. Uh, uh, were inspired by their desire to know the created universe. So, like you know, Isaac Newton talks about the origin of motion, you have to understand the point at which you know Allah created, God created the universe. When you know Rene Descartes was 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 uh, studying the Cartesian coordinates, you have to understand the geometric uh, relationship of, of the created universe. So it really opened up a new horizon for me. So from that point, I, I launched on a personal quest, if you will, to find out what this is all about because nobody had told me such. Though we had made that connection in the past. So, through my remaining years at the Naval Academy, I, I read and researched and talked to people. I did the best I can to get my uh, uh, you know, answers to questions that I had. And, and in so doing, I walked away with a certain standard of criteria, whether it was social, philosophical, or spiritual, or scientific, on, the, on what type of religion that I would adopt. For example, the scientific standard. I felt that since we're talking about the created universe, that revelation must necessarily be ahead of all scientific discoveries. Mm -hmm. that, that in no circumstance should science debunk revelation. Right? So I found that uh, standard quite challenging from most of the world's religions, except Islam. Islam answered those questions and, and they, there was just all sorts of scientific proofs in Islam that we're still trying to discover. And, and, and come to a better understand. I'll just give you one quick example. I was a navigator in the Navy, and it's still a bit of a mystery of how certain bodies of water don't intermingle with salinity content, temperature gradient, uh, the pressure. For, you know, for example, the way that the, the Mediterranean flows into the Atlantic, there's a pressure gradient difference causing weather, weather disturbances, etc. The Quran talks about that from an illiterate prophet 1600 years ago who's never seen the ocean. Right, so, so there's hundreds of these types of scientific proofs, and again, other standards, whether social or it, it, it met my standard, therefore I became a Muslim. Now, as such, because I was a military uh, naval officer or aspiring naval officer, I was very interested in what Islam had to say about the conduct of war. Mm -hmm. Because war, we, we were taught at Annapolis, if, if, if combat is not conducted with the highest of, of moral standards, you will literally lose your humanity on the battlefield. Because it's the most brutal act that human beings can engage in. And if you don't live and, 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 and conduct work by certain moral code, you will literally become an animal. So, you know, PTSD, all of these are symptoms of, of, of our soldiers expressing extreme duress and distress in combat. Um, anyways, there's volumes of, of books written about this subject matter. You can you know, look it up yourself. But, that's why it's so important. So I was curious, what does Islam say about war? Well, it turns out that Islam uh, says quite a bit about it. And, and what I discovered is that they had a very refined and high standard regarding uh, uh, the reasons for war and the conduct during war. Uh, in the Quran it says that permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made, because they have been wronged. Those who have been driven out from their homes unjustly only because they said, Our Lord is God. In another verse it says, And if God did not repulse some men by means of others, there would surely have been pulled down temple, churches, and synagogues, and mosques. So those two statements are clear, unequivocal, saying that, that, that fighting is sanctioned under the, for, for self-defense. Right? And secondly, for the freedom of worship. Notice it doesn't say just mosques, it says synagogues and churches. So all religions were obligated to protect. So the freedom of religion and for self-defense. Those are the reasons why it's sanctioned. So, and there, there's a lot more is said about it. And, and, and so when I started digging in deeper, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had quite a bit to say about uh, 
of war as well. I'm sure show you just one thing. Uh, and it's what we call today the rules of engagement. The manner in which you engage the enemy. Again, that moral code, right? Because there has to be certain rules and regulations on how you conduct yourself in the battlefield. These were the instructions he gave to his soldiers during war. Taking one step back, by the way, you might ask yourself, well, you're talking about the prophet of God, why would he, you know, why is he concerned himself about war and conduct and, and combat? Well, we believe that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a final messenger. So as such, he has to be complete in his totality of, of all human aspects, whether you're a brother, a parent, a husband, a son, a businessman, a student, a teacher, and even a warrior. So he exemplified those traits and left us uh, plenty of examples of how to conduct ourselves in, in all of those aspects of, of existence. So in matter in a matter in matters of combat, these are the instructions he gave the soldiers. She said, Number one, do not harm women, children, elderly, or the sick. Do not commit treachery and never mutilate or disfigure. Do not uproot, cut down, or burn trees. Do not harm any livestock except for food. In combat, avoid striking the face, for God created all of us in the image of Adam. Do not kill monks in monasteries, and do not kill those sitting in places of worship. Do not destroy the villages and towns. Do not spoil the cultivated fields and gardens. So in other words, you can't starve people out there anymore. Do not wish for an encounter with the enemy. Pray to God to grant you security. But when you are forced to encounter them, exercise patience. No one may punish with, ex with fire except the Creator. So in Islam, love is the mass destruction, chemical, nuclear, napalm, all of those will be for forbidden. And finally, accustom yourself to do good and do not do wrong even if they commit. So, you know, <clears throat> taking in totality, there are no other rules of engagement that I've come across during my time as a naval officer that, are, that were higher standards than those. None. You know, there, the Nuremberg trials, the Geneva Conventions, post-World War II, uh, a lesson to learn, all those embody today what we in the U.S. military utilize for the, uh, what we believe is the highest standard of rules of engagement. Those 10 things I didn't rattle off to you is the highest standard I've ever uh, came across. Okay, so let me just now talk about jihad. So the term jihad in Arabic uh, does not in and of itself have anything to do with what we all think it is. Okay, jihad comes from the root word jihad, which means to make an effort. So consequently, the highest form of jihad is to struggle with your own self, with your own ego. Right? That's the highest form of jihad. The lesser form of jihad is the, the, the military component. Um, and by the way, jihad is not, when they say holy war, we don't, it, that's, that doesn't ring true with us because we see nothing holy in war. It, it, there's nothing holy about it. It's, it's, just, it's, the, it's the means of last resort, if you will. Um, so again, just to give you a couple examples on the greater versus lesser jihad, um, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the best jihad is to speak truth to a tyrannical leader. And then in another instance, he said, Perform jihad by serving your parents. And there's on and on and on again about you know being the best human being as you can. That's the higher form of jihad, the less important being in the military. Okay, okay. To, uh, ISIS. So ISIS, um, you know, we believe that they're vigilantes. Um, it's what happened, ISIS by the way, there was no ISIS prior to the Iraq war. We all, I hope we all know that. Uh, we created a power vacuum by invading Iraq and then leaving. And that power vacuum is filled by this uh, vigilante group called ISIS. So it'd be the equivalent of, let's say, Russia came and invaded our country and left. So who would fill the power vacuum if they destroyed our police apparatus and security and government system? The Mississippi militia, right? They're the ones with the weapons and organized and have a cause. So, and somebody in some other part of the world would call them crazies. So it's a, it's, a, it's a geopolitical phenomenon, the rise of ISIS. They, they are not sanctioned at all by the, the, the broader Muslim community. The, the easiest way to look at it is, ISIS is to Islam what the KKK is to Christianity. Or maybe what fascism is to Christianity. Right? I mean, I read Mein Kampf and, and Hitler invokes a lot of Christian you know, thinking and, and, and theology on reasons why he's doing what he's doing. Right? So it's similarly, ISIS is, 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 a, is an extreme aberration of, of our religion and not with our fault. <laughs> um, that's it. No, <laughs> <laughs>